All right, so this is uh, the recorded presentation for 1117 for BUAN 6346 for the Friday night class. So tonight we were going to talk about uh, Apache Storm and go into some detail. And um, here we go. So the first thing we're talking about is real-time streaming data analytics. So, um, you know, we've talked about in the past about Batch analytics, we talked a little bit in the last class about um, streaming with Spark, and uh, we mentioned a little bit about the Lambda architecture. So um, we're gonna go into some scenarios here and discuss, so uh, for real-time streaming analytics. And so what if you are a financial services company and you need to analyze transactions in real time to prevent fraud? This is a, a, a common use case. And, or what if you're a telecom company like AT&T or Verizon, you need to analyze network traffic in real time to allocate cell towers dynamically. What if you need to monitor application logs in real time to respond to application anomalies as they happen? This is a really good use case for uh, security analytics. Actually, one of the projects uh, my group has worked on is in this area. What if you're a trucking company and you need to analyze real time data to modify uh, drive routes to save time and fuel costs? Not only for trucking companies, but delivery companies. You think of uh, UPS or even somebody like AT&T that has a large service fleet. How would you optimize that? So the previous scenarios all had one thing in common, and that is the availability of continuous streams of real-time data. Um, Apache Storm is a distributed computation system for processing continuous streams of real-time data. So it's a platform and a framework to be able to handle this type of information. Uh, Storm augments the batch processing capabilities provided by MapReduce. So um, it not only allows you to do batch processing, but this augments that in order to do stream processing. So what is Apache Storm? It's, uh, as I mentioned, it's a distributed and fault-tolerant real-time computation engine. Um, I have the URL there. Uh, these these uh, slides will be posted so you can go out to that URL. Um, it orig originated at Backtype, um, which became Twitter, um, which op was op it open sourced in 2011. It's implemented in a language called Clojure. I have a uh, link there that you can go out and look if you want to learn more about Clojure. Clojure is a Lisp um, syntax, very similar to Lisp. So if you've ever heard of Lisp or worked with Lisp, you know what you're getting into. And, and some of Apache Storm is actually written in Java. So Storm use cases. This is what Storm is commonly used for. So stream processing, uh, continuous computation, um, which you may wonder what's the difference between stream processing and continuous computation. Continuous computation is something where you know stream processing can be processing data and let it moving it and letting it go on, kind of like an ETL process. Continuous computation is something where you're computing something over a given period of time in a continuous fashion, maybe in Windows, so you're actually calculating something versus just processing. And then distributed remote procedure calls. So it allows Storm, you can set Storm up to actually call um, other systems remotely, and that's a, another use case for it. So Storm takes a assembly line approach, um, similar to the automotive industry or any really in, any manufacturing industry that uses the assembly line. Uh, complex tasks are accomplished by step by step by a series of workers performing different operations. There are identical parallel assembly lines to increase throughput, and in Storm, the assembly line is not always aligned. There are branches and even directed acyclic graphs factories. So it's not always a straight line. There could be, based upon the data coming in, it could branch. Um, some decisions are made on which process or which, which branch to go down or which assembly line. So uh, Storm doesn't have to be a straightforward assembly line. It can have, you know, almost, I guess, decisions in there, almost like a decision tree to decide which, uh, which branch to go down. So, um, Another thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of real-time versus batch processing. So we've talked about that a lot uh, recently. And, you know, what is real-time? How do you 
qualify that or, or uh, you know in terms and and definition and there's a lot of different ways you can do it in data uh, processing and and the client so data you know the age how how old is the data so commonly real time is usually referred to anything less than 15 minutes um, if it's older than 15 minutes you've now gone gone into what's considered batch location um, streaming real-time analytics is primarily done in memory um, it's moved to disk after processing uh, batch processing as you've known uh, with us working with uh, HDFS and other file systems it's primarily on disk you're reading it off a of disk you're doing a lot of computation you're writing to disk and then uh, you're writing it back out to a permanent storage location uh, it's moved to memory for processing as, as we've done with MapReduce and and even with Spark, we're pulling it off of the disk and putting it into memory for Spark to pro process. Processing is another area. Uh, speed, sub-seconds to a few seconds is considered real-time. And uh, that you can really understand the velocity of what we're dealing with there. And then there's batch um, for speed is a few seconds to an hour. These are your long-running jobs. When you're doing some pretty heavy lifting, it's going to take quite a bit of time. It could take quite a bit of time. There's also the concept of frequency under processing for real time. It's always running. Um, you're it's a continuous stream of data coming in. And for batch, it's sporadic to periodic. So this is, you're running something every week or every night. Um, a lot of the data ingest work that I've done in the past has been on a nightly basis. We build these large batch processing jobs that uh, basically work on all the data we've received for that particular day and so it's ready to go the next morning uh, for clients um, real time is as automated systems only um, basically that's because you it's you can't really have a human in the loop when you have real-time analytics at that point your the human is not able to react in the speed that they need to um, for batch processing it's human and automated systems and for the types you can see there it's primarily operational applications versus analytical applications for your real time and your batch I disagree with that a little bit with the primary operational applications you can have real-time analytics and I guess the difference there is where they're distinguishing is that the operational piece is that you're trying to make decisions in real time based of based upon analytics in order to do some sort of action or trigger something versus batch is primarily for doing large analytic um, applications or jobs. So uh, for some of the more of the storm use cases, uh, they break it down as this idea of prevention and optimization. So um, as you can see across the top there, you have sentiment analysis, click streams, that's you know, uh, how, what people are clicking on on a website through their browser, uh, machine sensors, this is your IoT type logs, uh, logs, these are systems logs, this is something for potentially real-time data analytics against um, uh, firewall logs in the security space or access logs and also geolocation, you know, this is another type of data that could be coming in um, location data this is you know with the referring to the trucking company this could be something used for optimizing the um, location and, and, and how they do their dispatches so this goes into two kind of, of uh, columns there the prevent and optimize and there's different silos there there's finance telecom retail manufacturing transportation and web and you can see where you know, either you're trying to prevent something with this real-time analytics or you're trying to make it better. So finance, you know, securities fraud, compliance violations, you're trying to catch things in real time versus order routing and pricing for optimization. And telecom, you know, network breaches and network outages, you're trying to prevent that with your real-time data as, versus optimization, you know, bandwidth allocation and customer service. Retail inventory overstock and understock, you're trying to prevent that. Um, if you can pick up on uh, analytics in real time of where people are going to be, or especially, you know, a good example is out of the holiday seasons approach, 
demand is going to spike in certain areas and over certain times, can you know you could use real time analytics to provide um, stock, uh, you know, and roll trucks out to stores that that need it. And uh, same for op optimizing offers and, and pricing. Same thing, if you want to target uh, target marketing um, for a particular um, product or, or a rollout, uh, real time analytics can help with that. For manufacturing, there's machine failures. Um, trying to stop that, you think about, um, you know, they also have on here transportation, but I'd put this under manufacturing as well. But uh, this concept of your car having all of these sensors, um, and your car is running real time analytics in it. There's streaming analytics going on in your car and coming back from your car and uh, trying to prevent failures. And um, with transportation, there's driver and fleet issues, as well as optimizing routes and pricing, and then web application failures, operational issues versus site content. So you can see how it can be broken down into these two areas, prevention and versus optimization. Either you're trying to stop something with your data, or you're trying to make something better. So this diagram uh, shows the concept of integrating the real-time processing workflow. So, uh, and this really is um, kind of another way of showing you what I showed uh, you know, at a previous lecture when I when I talked and I drew on the board this con concept of the lambda architecture where you have the batch layer and the speed layer. You have the real-time data feeds coming into storm. It's going to persist the data into Hadoop. You have your batch processing, so that's going to be your batch layer as well as your batch feeds. And then it's going to uh, have real-time alerts and data coming into your, your dashboards and your application. Um, the arrow going back to the left there shows update event models, patterns, templates, key performance indicators, and alerts. That's what I showed you with the Lambda architecture is that you have the batch layer that's doing the batch processing and really the training of your models to build up these models that can be interrogated in the speed layer. So then that would be pushed back to storm. And then as real time data feeds come in, you can interrogate those models and they'll give you a prediction, you know, whether you're trying to prevent something or optimize something. Um, so this, this is really tying in. It's, it's not shown the same way, but it's really describing a similar thing. Um, as the Lambda architecture that we discussed. So now that we've talked about real-time analytics and, and kind of the use cases for it and where it fits in, um, let's talk, let's get down into more of the nitty-gritty of, of what is actually in Storm and how it's built. Um, so Storm is built around this concept of topology. So uh, storm processes data in a topology, and a topology consists of spouts and bolt components. Spouts and bolts run on a system in a storm cluster. So a storm cluster consists of multiple nodes, um, you know, similar to Hadoop cluster. We have multiple data nodes. We have a name node. So storm cluster works on a similar concept of this multiple, uh, multiple. Um, uh, node cluster and these spouts and these bolts you can have multiple topologies coexist and process different data on the same cluster so you can have multiple topologies run and really you you run the storm um, application or your processing as a topology that's how you link it together it's going to be a set of sprout, uh, spouts and bolts. So in that spout and bolts, um, there's tuples. So we've talked about tuples quite a bit, um, and it's a common, um, common concept in technology for this technology, and it's the fundamental data unit in Storm, and it's a, a unit of work to process, and topologies process these tuples. So on the on the, the right there, um, I have some examples. It's basically just an ordered list of values, and it could be of any type. Um, and each, each field in a tuple must have an assigned field name. So it's not like in some of the other technologies we've talked about where you can have um, 
tuples referred to as their location. This has to have a field name associated with it. So in the example on the right, the first one is just a set of numbers. The second one has some names, a location, as well as a decimal. And then the last one can be some binary data plus a number. So you can have mix and match in the, in the tuple. It doesn't all have to be the same data type. So one of the technologies that Storm utilizes quite a bit is message queues, and it's often the source of the data processed by Storm. Um, Storm can integrate with many ty different types of message queues. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this in class. We didn't go into a lot of detail of what those could be, but uh, Kafka is a big one in the big data space, and it's um, there's RabbitMQ, Kestrel, JMS. These are all different implementations of the same concept, this idea of a pub sub or publish subscribe message queue. And that's where you have these real-time data sources like operating systems, services, application sensors, you know, that are producing these, um, this data and it could be a log entry, error statuses, messages, all kinds of things. And it goes into a message queue at which Storm pulls that off. So most of the time when you're using Storm, that's where you're gonna get your data from is one of these pub sub kind of message queue uh, type environment. And Storm will um, pull this information off and it will create something called streams. It's one of the core abstractions in Storm and it's an unbounded sequence of tuples. So we talked about what tuples are. So think of, um, you know, tuples as kind of the, the, in networking, it's the packet coming across the wire. So a stream is this um, the, this unbounded sequence of, of these tuples coming across, and each stream is assigned an ID when it's created. This is important for um, for fault tolerance and everything to understand where this data is coming from. You know, if, if you know for resiliency and needing to recover, and so each stream ID is uh, given when it's declared. Now you can have a stream ID of default. If you don't declare it, you're giving one of the certain classes, it'll just assign it default. But um, it, 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 it we'll talk about later, but each one needs to have a unique stream ID. So um, it, even giving it the default ID is probably not the best idea for, for actual processing. You want to give it a true, truly unique ID. So, a spout is a source of streams in a topology. So we had talked about um, the major components being streams and bolts that make up your topology. So a stream is what actually, or I'm sorry, a uh, spout is actually what creates the stream. So a spout, um, it's reading data from an external source and emits one or more streams of spout uh, tuples into a topology. And each one of these streams, like I mentioned, requires a stream ID coming out of the spout. So spouts can be both reliable or unreliable. A reliable spout replays a tuple that failed to, to, to process. An unreliable spout does not replay a, a tuple that failed to be processed. So, um, you know, there's different reasons why you would want that. You know, um, if you're going to replace uh, tuples that fail, there's gonna be some latency issues and then some speed issues, but it's gonna be much more reliable um, if you're worried more about throughput and don't is, aren't gonna to be too upset if a tuple drops or doesn't get processed, an unreliable, unreliable spout would be much quicker. So the streams um, are produced by the spouts and then the streams then go to bolts, and a bolt implements the actual data processing logic. A bolt processes each tuple in a stream and emits a new stream of tuples. Uh, think of it um, similar to how we talked in Spark streaming, or even um, some of the other Spark concept, is that when you do some sort of logic on it, especially transformations, it'll produce new RDDs. In Spark streaming, you have a, in a stream and a D stream, you have a series of RDDs, and then you do some sort of calculation or, or, or um, transformation on that, it's going to produce new um, RDDs in the D stream. So 
think about it that way too is that these bolts are having the data processing logic on these tuples and then it creates new tuples and emits uh, a new stream of tuples after it it calculates or does some sort of transformation against it and a bolt can run, run a function or filter it can do aggregation or joins on tuples uh, bolts can also send tuples to other message queues databases HDFS and more so um, bolts can you know act as a sync and, and save things to a particular database if necessary and um, but it can also do processing um, complex transformations and analysis is possible by connecting multiple bolts together so it's creating a a chain of bolts or a topology of bolts so you can um, in the example there it, at the bottom it shows that you're actually it's combining two streams so it's joining um, uh, two streams coming from bolts and you can have it go the other way you can also have it make decisions you know if this particular data if I make this calculation it's going to send it down to this bolt or it may send it to the other bolt so you can do some pretty complex uh, ideas uh, working on that so now that we've talked about bolts and and kind of the the high-level concepts of, of what makes up storm you know how how a storm actually architected so the storm architecture um, as mentioned before it's implemented as a cluster of machines they have something called Nimbus which is the, the master node daemon that runs storm so it's similar function to the yarn resource manager as we had talked uh, uh, previously in our class when we discussed yarn and it distributes the program code around the cluster. That's its responsibility. It assigns the tasks, it handles failures, and it responds to topology administration requests. So it's the it's the main the main guy. It's 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 the kind of the master node. So um, and below that you have uh, supervisor or slave node daemons that that work and similar function to the yard the yarn node managers and those actually are the ones that runs the bolt run the bolts and the spouts as tasks um, commonly they run on hadoop um, here it says slave machines but it's the hadoop uh, data nodes or, or the um, the sub nodes that that are in the hadoop cluster and then there's something called zookeeper so zookeeper is a cluster coordinator um, it stores the cluster met matrix metrics so it stands between Nimbus and the supervisor so it's what the supervisors talk to to communicate to Nimbus and, and vice versa so zookeeper is its own cluster um, you have a cluster of these zookeeper nodes and this keeps all the information and acts as kind of a middleman to keep Nimbus and the supervisor uh, nodes um, talking and, and, and sync with each other. Since I mentioned um, uh, some of the Hadoop concepts in relation to Nimbus and the supervisor, um, let's take a look of how these compare to each other. So how, do the, how does the Hadoop MapReduce and Storm topologies compare? Um, Storm is very superficially similar similar to Hadoop cluster as a kind of a high level of the same concepts Storm and Hadoop provide a highly parallel processing cluster to reliably process massive amounts of data and both Storm and Hadoop clusters can share the same machines um, each is implemented using different daemons and libraries so the physical topology of the cluster can be the same since they they physically you know at a high level resemble but since they use different daemons and different libraries they can coexist on these machines together it, it, you do have to be careful that hopefully one doesn't clobber the other you run into that issue anytime that you're going to co-locate co clusters like this on the same machinery you just hope that one doesn't take the resources of the other um, so that's something to be uh, aware of if you're ever in an environment where they're doing this but um, you can see the comparison there of a Hadoop cluster and a storm cluster they're both scalable uh, you know Hadoop guarantees no data loss because the idea behind as much as it can it guarantee it the idea behind the replication and everything that you get out of the box and um, 
the storm cluster can guarantee no data loss, um, just depending on how it's set up. You know, we talked about the reliable spouts versus the unreliable, so it can guarantee no data loss. And then you can see that the Hadoop cluster is primarily meant for batch processing. Storm is real time. And with Hadoop, jobs run to completion and then they're done. Um, storm clusters, the topologies will run until they're, com the, until they're stopped. They're meant to just to continuously run. And then you can see that Hadoop has stateful nodes and stateless nodes for storm cluster. So after discussing that, um, some of the other concept here is this idea of worker processes and executors and tasks. So each supervisor machine uses three entities to run a subset of topologies. This idea of a worker processor, I'm sorry, a worker process, an executor, and a task. And adding more machines with more of these entities can increase storm processing scalability. So just like Hadoop, you add more machines, you're going to get that that uh, horizontal scalability. So uh, each supervisor machine can run more one or more worker um, processes, and each worker process is a Java virtual machine. So um, you know this uses this is using JVMs underneath the the covers. So if you're not familiar with Java, that's okay. But just be aware that that's how it's running. It's a, a Java virtual machine, which is this um, this encapsulated kind of um, just like you know if if you've used the HortonWorks virtual machine or, or other virtual machines, it's an encapsulated uh, unit of processing and, and memory. So that's what this is doing for the JVMs. And in each side of those, each worker process runs one or more threads called executors. So um, this is very similar to how uh, Yarn and Spark work. This idea that you can have um, these long-living executors there that are assigned tasks, and it'll it'll complete a task, and then you can assign something else to it. And so for this one, it's one task per executor by default. Uh, if an executor runs more than one task, all tasks must be the same component type, spout or bolt, which makes sense because if there were different component types, um, it, it, you know, you could run into some issues there. So um, a task performs the, the spout or bolt data processing, a spout or bolt can run in parallel across many tasks. So uh, that means a single spout or a single bolt can run across many tasks. So you could be processing multiple tuples from the same bolt or spout uh, in parallel um, within one worker process. So how is, you know, we mentioned that it can be done in parallel, so how, how is that done? So let's let's take a look here. So uh, parallel execution of a topology component. So what this is is that a user code develop, is developed for a topology and it's submitted to Nimbus, um, which, you know, we noted is the, uh, the the master supervisor for all this, and it's transferred it's transferred to appropriate supervisor machines. So, remember that Nimbus is responsible for uh, transferring the code to the cluster and to the different areas. So, this shows that you have a spout A that has two tasks, and then it's assigned to uh, two different machines, and those machines work, and then the output of that goes to different bolts that are spread across um, several different machines. He has a bolt A has two tasks and then you have bolt C with one task and so you can see how the data is sent to and replicated across to the different bolts and then um, and so on it goes goes to the next one so you can see how that executes. Um, a spout or bolt is commonly run as a set of parallel tasks when a tuple is sent to a bolt, you know, which bolt task is it sent to? So for example, when a task in spout A needs to send a tuple to bolt A, which task in bolt A should receive it? Um, a developer selectable stream grouping defines how the tuple in the stream should be partitioned among bolt tasks. So there's different ways that you can group this to, for it to figure out which one does it go to. Um, and Storm has several of these built in. So as you can see in this example in the diagram, it illustrates what these Storm groupings are. You know, how does it decide 
you know, when it's running in parallel like this, which bolt gets it, you know, um, or does it go to all of them? Does it only go to one? So, uh, you know, let's take a look at that. So for stream grouping types, we have shuffle grouping. So, um, as you can guess by the name, you know, it's tuples are randomly distributed across the bolts task in a way such that each task is guaranteed to get equal number of tuples. So, um, it's just going to randomly spread it across the bolts, but in a way that's, it's, it's randomly selected, but it's distributed evenly. Um, all grouping, so this is the tuples are replicated across all the bolt tasks. So um, there are maybe some computations where you have to do that. Uh, there's global groupings, an entire stream is sent to the bolt task with the lowest ID number. All tasks are assigned a unique ID, so um, it'll send an entire stream to a, the lowest ID number. None grouping, so currently none groupings are equivalent to shuffle grouping. So, um, and then there's something else called a direct grouping where the tuples sender decides which task will receive uh, the tuple. There's also local or shuffle grouping. If the target bolt has one or more tasks in the same worker process as the sender, tuples will be shuffled to just those in process tasks. Otherwise, this acts like a normal shuffle grouping. And then there's uh, fields groupings. Tuples with the same value in a user-specified field are routed to the same task. So you can have it, um, you know, grouped by a particular field. And then you're, you know, in similar how we do group by key and some of the work we've done in RDDs and, and, and other groupings within MapReduce, how all the keys or all the values for a specific key are sent to a reducer field groupings acts the same way. You can guarantee that everything grouped with a certain value will, will go to the same bolt. Um, so field groupings and out, output field decoration. So each field in a tuple emitted by a spout or a bolt is assigned a name. This is useful because the field grouping stream grouping routes tuples to specific bolt tasks based on a specific tuple field having a specific value. That's kind of a mouthful there, but the idea is is that you want each field that it is the tuple emits has to have a name assigned to it, and uh, and it makes it easier for these cases where we want to do the field grouping because then you can specify by the name. So in the example here, it shows and there's a little bit of code with it, but the idea behind it is is that it shows that um, for Declaring the output fields within the Java code, you have to declare what those output fields are going to be. So for this particular one, there's two fields that are in the tuple, and you have a double and a, double and a triple value. And in the other one, for the declared output fields, you just have a single one for the bolt, which is word. It's just going to spit out a word. So that was kind of a quick, um, quick run through of the different components of Storm. Um, we're not going to go into Storm too deep in this lecture as far as implementation and code because Storm in and of itself is very much heavy in Java and some other languages. We are going to talk here in a few slides about how you can use Storm with other languages, um, but you still have to get your hands a little dirty with Java. So um, because of the nature of this class, we're not going to do any exercises with that. But um, this is a technology that you should be aware of. Um, especially how it relates to Spark uh, streaming and the fact that this idea of streaming analytics, as you get more into data analytics, is going to be much more prevalent field and a, and a component to your everyday life. So um, I've got some further reading there where you can get more information about Storm. Um, you can go to the website. It has manuals, tutorials. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of good books out there about Storm right now. Um, you can take a look on Safari. There are a few books um, that you can take a look at. So, you know, a few things to remember with Storm. Um, uh, you know, takeaways from this is that I want you to remember that a Hadoop cluster runs MapReduce, Tez, HBase, Solar, Flume, and other job types, while Storm cluster runs topologies. That's all Storm does is run topologies. And Storm and Hadoop can run on the same machines. A Storm topology consists of spouts and bolts. 
those two components, and then a spout ingests the data from a source and emits a stream of tuples to one or more bolts. A bolt can run a function or filter, aggregate or join, or join tuples together. So that's, remember that, that a spout is actually ingesting the data from a source and emitting a stream of tuples, and a bolt actually runs the computation on the tuples that it gets from a stream. And multiple bolts can be joined together to perform very complex data processing jobs. Uh, remember that as well. A storm cluster includes a Nimbus master daemon, one or more supervisor slave daemons, and a zookeeper ensemble used for storm cluster coordination. So those are the main physical architectural components of a storm environment. And remember that the Nimbus machine provides cluster management and each supervisor machine runs one or more spout and bolts. And each spout and bolt runs as a task inside an executor while executors run inside worker processes. And a worker process is a JVM, an executor is a thread running inside the JVM. And stream groupings determine how tuples are routed between spouts, bolts, and tasks. So this is probably the single most important slide in this presentation. If you take nothing away, make sure you understand this slide and all the components on it, and you should be good to go for any possible quizzes or tests that come out of this. So I mentioned before that we weren't going to get in too far into this with the coding because it's, it's heavy in Java, and as I point out here with the programming languages in Storm, you know, Storm itself is written in Java and Clojure, and all Storm interfaces are specified as Java interfaces, and all Storm usage must go through the Storm Java API. So that includes Storm topology, spouts, bolts, written in Java, execute, and the JVM-based worker processes. Uh, topologies and individual spouts and bolts can be written in other languages, though. Even though you have to go through the Java APIs, you can still write um, your topologies in other languages. For example, you can use JavaScript, Python, Ruby, Perl, PHP, and there's many others. And uh, spouts and bolts written in other languages execute through special Java shell spout and shell bolt classes. So what these do is it acts as a wrapper. Since you have to submit through the Java processes and interfaces, this acts as a wrapper and calls your non-Java code. So think of it as, as a, just kind of a wrapper or a shell around it. And, um, and then that way they can implement the spout or bolt logic in another language. So um, in that vein, you know, since we have to go through the Java processes and everything, how, what are the Storm's operating modes? So Storm has two operating modes. It's uh, just, there's a distributed mode and a local mode. Um, distributed mode operates as a cluster of machines. This is the normal operating mode. So we talked about Nimbus and the supervisors and Zookeeper. This is its normal mode of operation. But there is also something called local mode, which simulates a cluster using a process running multiple threads on a single machine. So why would you want to do that? Um, this is very useful for testing, for topology development, you know, if you're doing it on a single machine. Um, it's a good way to, to, to kind of get your stuff in order and tested before you then submit it to a, to a, larger, um, uh, a larger cluster. So um, how does this work for submitting a storm topology to a distributed cluster? So um, there at the top, you see a little code example. You have storm and then your jar, and then you're going to submit a user jar. So a jar is a Java archive file, it's a zip file, if you're not familiar with that. It's what the compiled Java code is, is packaged up into. So it's it's really, you could open a jar just by changing the, it, the extension to zip. It's just, it uses the same compression, but um, that's how Java recognizes um, these package code. And then you give it the, the name of the topology and its options, and that's how you submit it. So, you know, from a storm client, uh, develop code for spouts and bolts and the topology is packaged into a jar and then from there the storm client uses the storm jar command to submit the jar file to Nimbus and remember that Nimbus is responsible for distributing the code across the cluster 
So supervisors download the code from the Nimbus machine and the Nimbus and the supervisor store the jar file beneath the parent direct directory specified in this particular uh, this YAML file, which is a, um, it's uh, actually YAML stands for yet another markup language, Y-A-M-L, um, similar to YARN, yet another resource um, uh, negotiator. So it stores it, that information in this, um, the parent directory for that, so that way, you know, the system knows where to find it. So let's look at some example topology code. So this may look a little strange. If you haven't looked at Java, it's all right. I mean, this is this is what's called a main function. This is the main entry into this, into any Java application. You have your, it's declaring a topology builder class. And from your topology builder, you're gonna set your spouts and bolts. That's all it's doing. So for this particular one, it's, uh, it's doing a random sit sentence spout. It's a test spout that someone had developed, and then it's doing a two bolts. One of it splits the sentence, and then does a shuffle grouping, which means it's going to send it across to the other bolts, and then it's going to do a count. So this is if if you could guess from this and everything we've ever done in this class and our examples, this is yet another way to do word count. Um, so this is going to generate random sentences, split the sentences, and then count them within the different bolts. Um, and then you see at the bottom of the code there, it actually submits this code. Um, that's the submit topology, and that's it's getting submitted to Nimbus. So this is uh, graphically down there. It shows how this is going to work. You're going to have a sentence spout, and um, it's going to... Uh, a random sentence generator spout and it's going to run across five executors it's going to shuffle and go across and uh, you're going to run your split sentence on eight different executors and then you have your fields grouping and then that's where it's going to actually count the words so this is a, a yet another way to do word count so we've looked at how to build something with uh, Java. So now using Storm with non-Java languages, how do we do that? So um, like I said before, you can use the non-Java languages to create your topologies um, and create individual spouts and bolts. Um, it talks about how Storm topologies are just thrift structures and Nimbus is a thrift daemon. We're not going to go in, <laughs> into detail about what thrift is in this. That goes beyond this class, but um, you know, thrift is a is a technology, it's a protocol for for uh, for applications to to talk. You know, there's thrift servers. Hadoop uses a lot of this concept of thrift in there. So what it's basically trying to say is that underneath, it's just these thrift structures. So if you have languages that can produce these things, you don't have to use Java. So you know, Thrift supports multiple languages, so that means that topologies can be submitted in multiple languages. Um, so I have a URL there if you want to go look to learn how to do this in more example. You know, if anybody's looking more to get into a data engineering role, this would be a good thing to look at. But um, for those in the data analytics, probably not something you need to worry about. But um, so in order to submit non-Java topologies, you use the storm shell command. And here's an example of someone submitting a Python uh, example, uh, code. You have storm shell, um, which is the command, the resource, which contains your Python script. You have to specify the language as well as the topology um, file and then any options that goes into that code. So this is how you would submit something that is not Java based. So uh, store multi-language protocol. So what this is talking about is this idea that um, the, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so this, this is showing how Storm has a protocol for communicating for non-Java language um, uh, implementations of topology. So this is showing that um, on the right there, it's actually using JSON to communicate for standard in and out for the messages and the subprocesses. So 
and this for example PHP Python uh, JavaScript and other non uh, Java languages the supervisor launches a sub process to run the non Java spout or bolt uh, functionality in the Java classes shell spout and shell bolt is used to help communicate with the new sub processes to communicate and manage these sub processes the supervisor uses the storm multi lang protocol the multi lang protocol defines communications using JSON encoded strings over standard in and standard out the non-Java spout or bolt must be able to read and send JSON encoded messages in the format specified by the storm multi-link product protocol. So in order for one of these non-Java languages to work, it has to be able to support this JSON based protocol. And that's how it's able to talk and communicate between the sub process and the supervisors to make sure everything works. So here's a, quick example of a Python spout. Um, this is how to create a new wrapper around it. And uh, the new wrapper um, it extends the shell spout and it shows the Java wrapper class and then the program and actual script name to run inside there it says Python and then word Python script and then underneath there it has the declare, declare new fields and it tells how to declare it. So this is the wrapper that I was talking about that goes goes around the Python script. So this is uh, this is the last slide I had. Um, the main thing I want you to take away with the storm is that um, in form and function, in form it's very similar to a Hadoop cluster and function. It does something very similar to what we talked about in Spark streaming. Um, you know, there's another video that I've supplied that I want you to, to look at that talks about um, Yarn and, uh, I'm sorry, that talks about Storm and talks about Spark um, and when to use which, but um, I mainly want you to be aware of this technology and how it's used um, so that maybe in the future if you do get uh, into this area, you know of the tools. So. Um, so that concludes our presentation.